So here's the deal. There's a fifth function of money that cryptocurrency brings to the fore. It is social control. Social control. That's the fifth function of money. The other thing is, this is why the central banks are so worried about cryptocurrency. Here's a, a, one of, a modern example, or I guess kind of a current uh, example that expresses why they're so concerned. So as you know, Biden has threatened to kick Russia off of SWIFT, right? If you're Vladimir Putin, what do you do? What currency do you use if you get kicked off of SWIFT? Use Bitcoin. Use something. It doesn't matter. Kick me off of SWIFT. I don't care. I'll just, you know, I will adopt my entire economy to a Bitcoin standard. So that's the issue with respect to social control. Now, what do we mean by social control? Dr. Lou put up this chart. Social control encompasses the entire flower. And there are two things I want to point out. Number one, money is not universally access accessible. There are certain groups, certain people who do not have access to money. We know that because there's a certain percentage of the U.S. population that does not have banking accounts or checking accounts or money. Why is that? And the other thing is, in terms of uh, being central bank issued, fiat currency being central bank issued, that's also a myth. It's basically issued by commercial banks. The way you know that is that there are no poor people who are on the Federal Reserve Board. There are no welfare, welfare mothers. Yeah, none of that group is on the Federal Reserve Board. It's all bankers, which is fine. I mean, I get it. I get it. You want people who have technical expertise in finance to be on the board of the Federal Reserve. Bunch of economists. I get it. You know. But that definitely uh, relates to the issue of who controls money and how they control money. So, in terms of social control, the first level is, is that only a central bank has the right to issue uh, uh, fiat currency. The monetary social control theory that I've come up with kind of explains the manner by which uh, uh, money and currency determines the allocation of primary resources needed for life cycle survival in a functioning modern society. What are those things? Food, water, first aid, medical care, thermal resources and shelter, sanitation, hygiene, lighting, communication. You can't get any of those things in a modern functioning economy without money. You can kind of barter for them, sure, but at some point some money is going to change hands in order for you to be able to live. And then, and then finally, the racial monetary control theory explains why certain groups are, it, the, the current system supports the historical distribution of economic resources by ethnic or racial group. Once again, the way you know that is look at the black-white wealth distributions. Here's the thing about that, black-white wealth distributions. For that black-white wealth distribution to be valid and justified, it would have to mean that black people are inferior economically, socially, whatever, uh, actually inferior. But we know, we know through a number of examples that that's simply not the case. So then you have to ask yourself the question, why is money distributed in that way? It's because the, the, the systems that have been put into place exist to keep money out of the hands of certain people, certain groups of people. That's kind of what the, oh. This was a thing, Dave Chappelle on social control and money. I'm going to skip through. As soon as I check in the hotels. Welcome to Disney World, Mr. Chappelle. Can we interest you in some Disney dollars? <laughs> nah, man, I'm cool. I like them greenbacks. I like them greenbacks. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's the kind of money people spend. People are very particular about that. I saw that, that was one of the main stories from the war, it was the first big thing we did was they said, now that Iraq has been liberated, we have managed to take Saddam Hussein's face off of the money. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, when that press conference came out, I was like choked up. I was, I was actually proud to be an American because that is a very subtle psychological nuance of oppression to have a dictator on your money. And it's right? thoughtful, but then I thought, well, if you could do that for Iraq, what about our money, man? Yeah. 
Our money looked like baseball cars with slave owners on. For slaveholders, you know? So, so it really does start to speak to uh, uh, issues of, of social control. So this is the key. There is a fifth function of money, which none of the Western economists have dared to discuss and talk about until now, because cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, forces that functionality into the open. You can't ignore the social control aspects uh, uh, of money. And until we do that, we're always going to be behind the curve, because Surfacing that social control functionality explains the reluctance of central banks, of regulators. It also explains the attraction of the technology to people like El Salvador and to Russia, kind of why they are glomming on to this technology. It's because it gets them out from under a social control mechanism which has not necessarily helped them to maximize social return for their societies. So it is with any underserved, discriminated against group in the world. That's why you can't stop this. You can try, you know? And, and again, it's not like Bitcoin will be the end all and be all. I, I don't think, I think you're going to get Bitcoin 2.0. I think you're going to get Bitcoin 3. I don't know what it looks like. All I know is that once this type of technology has surfaced and has proven its utility in helping people to self actualize, then uh, you can't really get rid of it. You really should try to uh, get along. Final thing I'll say, final thing I'll say is this. If you think about why Satoshi created Bitcoin and by extension blockchain, it was because of the failure of regulators to protect the public interest in the years leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. What happened was investment banks utilized the dollar standing as global reserve currency to distribute and sell fraudulent financial products around the world. Regulators should have stepped in. They should have said, hey, you can't use the U.S. dollar status as global reserve currency to sell subprime loans and securities in the U.K. and in China and in all other places, because that's what you're doing. You're using the fact that the dollar is distributed all over the world to sell these securities in. Uh, knowing that those securities did not represent the kind of value that you claim that they represented. In a normal world, in a fully functional uh, uh, financial regulatory regime, the regulators in the U.S., because it's our dollar, regulators in the U.S. would have stepped in and stopped that. Say, hey, you can't use the dollar status as global reserve currency for uh, profit maximizing motives for individual financial institutions. My hope, and one of the reasons why I'm so engaged with GBA, and thank you, by the way, Gerard, for uh, inviting me and letting me talk, because Gerard said, whoa, you know, man, if you think that, hey, we got a conference coming up, maybe you can say that. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm so engaged here is because I do think that this new technology represents an opportunity to help maximize social return. Uh, using these these new digital uh, uh, digital tools, so I think that's about it. Look for the. We'll